Okay, once again, we welcome everyone to our video Bible study as we continue our study of the uh, prophecy of Joel. This should be our, our sixth and our final in the series of studies on the prophecy of Joel. We are continuing to use some questions that help us prepare for the study. These questions are available on our website at BibleStudyLessons.com. Joel, as we have examined, is a prophet uh, to Judah, probably during the period of divided kingdom, although perhaps in the period of Judah alone. And his prophecy was, was based upon a locust plague. So the first part of the chapter of the book rather describes the locust plague, which I believe was a literal plague that God brought upon them as a judgment to motivate the people to repent. Uh, so the book discusses the importance of repentance and the blessings God would send them if they would repent. But in the last part of the book, what we've been learning is that God is using uh, these events to Judah in the Old Testament to teach some very important lessons to us in the New Testament. And so in particular, we have uh, uh, the last section of chapter 2 of Joel predicted the coming of the Holy Spirit, which Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 referred to, quoted, and said that it was being fulfilled in those days. So this prophecy of Joel that would happen afterward in those days, he said, Peter said was being fulfilled beginning there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 in the last days. And so we know that the last days actually began on Pentecost and continue, even as we're taught in Hebrews chapter 1, throughout the period of time in which Jesus is speaking to us through his gospel, who is his New Testament. And so there are various wonders and miracles and so on that were predicted uh, in Joel chapter 2, fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, but then it continues into chapter 3, where we are in our study now. And in this section in chapter 3 uh, would be maybe sound like literal punishment on the enemies of Judah, but it turns out that it's actually a symbol of uh, God's punishment on those who would persecute his people under the New Testament. And the reason we know that is because it says, just as we continue in chapter 2, that in, those, in the last days, we continue in chapter 3, it says in those days, at that time, these things would happen. And we'll see more expressions like that as we continue our study tonight. So the uh, punishment that would come upon those who are symbols here of the enemies of Judah those symbols then teach us as well uh, that God will protect his people today and he will um, punish those who would persecute his people. So we should put on the whole armor of God and fight the good fight of faith and so on. So that's the lessons that we're studying about as we conclude the book of Joel in Joel chapter 3. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we continue in our study this evening? All right, let's go ahead and read the last part of uh, Joel chapter 3. Who would like to read chapter 3 verses 18 through 21 for us, please? Joel chapter 3, verse 18 through 21. Who would like to read that for us, please? I can read that. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Go ahead. Okay. Um, verse 18. And in that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. England, or England, <laughs> Egypt will become a waste, and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah, in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever in Jerusalem for all generations. And I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. All right. So as we look at these verses, um, what does he say in verse 18 is going to happen? He describes some things that would happen, again, the blessings uh, that would uh, occur in this time. What are some things he says would happen in verse 18? This is question number 24. The mountains and hills would drip with wine and milk. Okay, mountains uh, dripping with wine, hills flowing with milk. Well, 
Does that happen literally? Obviously not. So this shows us that this is symbolism. We are teaching, de dealing with symbols here. Uh, so what would that symbolize? So I ask you the question to think about that. Uh, what would these kinds of things symbolize? Uh, wine and, and milk and uh, water and so on. Uh, what is what is the new wine symbolized earlier in the book? A good harvest. Okay. Right. So remember that the locusts destroyed the harvest, including the wine and the grain and the uh, olives with their oil and so on. So then when the, if the people would repent, God would prom promise that he would restore the harvest and the blessings to them. Uh, but now we're talking spiritually. We're not talking literally uh, anymore uh, because mountains don't literally drip with wine and because the context is talking about uh, the, uh, the future time. Notice again the first part of verse 18, it will come to pass in that day. Talking again, the future time, the last days as we've been discussing. So the uh, what about the milk? What can you think of concepts or teaching in the Old Testament where milk was a symbol of a blessing. Anybody think of examples of that? S strength and nutrition. Okay. All right. What did God, what did, how did God describe the promise, promised land to the people? It was a land what? Flowing and with milk, milk and, honey. and honey. Milk and honey. So you see there again, the milk was a, a blessing from God. But, but, but then it becomes a symbol you see here you symbolically, the hills don't literally flow with milk, but it's a symbol of God's blessing to his people under the New Testament. Okay, so we also have the, um, the brooks, which he says would uh, be flooded with water. Well, water also is a, uh, often symbolizes God's blessings to his people. Um, so uh, the significance of this question number 26, then, of these kinds of things, is what? How does, how does this tie to what we've been studying about the, the future blessings of God's people? How would you explain that? Well, the way I look at it, these are all very good things all right. coming from God. All right, all blessings from God. And he promises us good thing today. Okay, so today we have blessings spiritual blessings especially. But he still promises us these good things to death. Right. So uh, here is a symbol description of... David, I'm not sure if... Go ahead. What was it what you started saying? I'm not sure if this is what you're looking for. I also think maybe my voice is getting delayed. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, back in those chapters, uh, what is it, Deuteronomy 28... Uh, where the Lord tells the people, if you'll just obey me, you know, your crops will come in well, your enemies will be defeated, you know, everything will be good for you. And, uh, you know, maybe we can find some specific meanings of, of these things, but, but maybe the, the best way to look at it is, is it, it's the parallel to how richly God would bless Israel if they would be his children. And, and if God, if, if we'll be his children, God will bless us richly, but as you're alluding to in, in spiritual ways. Okay, exactly. And that's the point. And so rather than trying to look for specific meanings, it's a, I believe it's a general blessing that God has promised to his people. He's going to take care of us. He's going to protect us from those who would oppose us. Again, not necessarily physically, because God's people, even in the New Testament, often did suffer at the hands of their enemies. But he has promised us that, that we can uh, endure those temptations. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, that uh, no temptation can compel, compel us to fall away from God. Uh, he provides the weapons that we need to defeat Satan, that we can receive ultimately eternal life. Okay, other questions or comments are through verse 18 then. All right, now verse 19, we have... A couple of other nations mentioned. What nations and cities were mentioned earlier in the chapter? You remember what one city mentioned earlier? Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon and Philistia. Well, those are typical 
enemies of Judah, many times the prophets would refer to these as uh, enemies of, of the people of Israel, but now they're being used symbolically of the enemies of God's people. Well, we've got two more enemies in verse 19, and who is that? Who are the enemies mentioned in verse 19? Egypt and Eden. Egypt, Egypt and Edom. And Edom. And these also are used uh, very frequently as symbols of the enemies of God's people. Uh, mm -hmm. These kinds of things we learn as we go through the prophets. We'll see this kind of language again and again. But what would happen to Egypt and Edom then in this, uh, in verse 19? All right, a desolate a, wilderness. All right, a desolation, the passage says. Uh, desolate and a wilderness uh, because of their violence against God's people. They have shed innocent blood. So I ask you, and this may be one of the more difficult questions that I've asked you, but question number 28, uh, can you find other passages where in the Old Testament uses, or uses references to Egypt or Edom as symbols of God's people, God's enemies? enemies of God's people. Any other passages you can find that, that talk about that? They're there, but uh, did you find any of them? Question 28. Uh, Ezekiel 29.10. Also uh, Ezekiel. Okay. Ezekiel 29, that whole section, verses 8 through 12. Somebody mentioned another one. What was that other one? Okay, and it's also in the book of Amos, the very next Numbers book. 20, 18 through 20. Okay, and it's there several times. So we're going to see it in the very next book that we study when we come back to the Minor Prophets, Amos chapter 9 and verse 12. It's also used there. The whole book of Obadiah is a prophecy against Edom for their uh, sins against Israel. So this is a common uh, symbolism used in, by the prophets. But in this case, it's not just a symbol of the enemies of Israel in general, but specifically the, en the enemies of God's people under the New Testament. And again, we need to study the, the context and uh, other passages. Let the Bible explain itself to us. Rather than just speculating about these things, we let the Bible explain itself. And we can understand then what God is saying here is that he will protect his people but he will punish those who would per, uh, persecute the people of God. Okay, so verse 18, uh, God's blessings upon his people. Verse 19, his punishments upon those who oppose them. Now verse 20, back to the people of God. What's going to happen to the people of God now? Verse 20. Okay, what does he say? abide forever. Abide forever. Jerusalem from generation to generation, it says. Okay, so again, in contrast to the, the enemies, God's people would be blessed. But remember, Judah and Jerusalem, these are here symbols spiritually of the church uh, and the people of God under the New Testament. They're going to continue to be blessed by God. Okay. Now, the last part of, of, of verse 21, the last verse, uh, you have some questions of translation. Uh, the new King James brother, you know, says, I will acquit them of bloodshed whom I have not acquitted. I think as Dave read it, it said something to the effect that I will uh, avenge those I have not avenged. But I, even though they sound different, I think the lesson is the same. What's the significance of this? Whether he avenges those who haven't been avenged or acquits those who haven't been acquitted, what's the significance of what God is promising here in verse 21? <clears throat> that he's going to take care of it. Okay. Justice is going to be done. Exactly. So whereas um, there's suffering by those who are doing good, that's going to be taken care of by God. He's going to make sure that those who do right are going to be rewarded. And whereas there is maybe seems to be blessings to those who are doing evil, he's going to take care of that too. And so the book ends with a, a promise 
that God's people are going to be blessed. Those who oppose God and his people are going to suffer. They're going to be punished. And so it's, a, again, the message of uh, a day of judgment, a day of reckoning, in which God will make right the things that have been, uh, perhaps not have been right during this life. All right. Questions or comments anybody has as, as we con reach a conclusion of the book then? All right, one of the questions that I wanted you to do in preparing for tonight's lesson was to uh, come up with some lessons, uh, some concepts that you've learned or that you've seen taught in the book of Joel. So tell me some of the things that you think you've learned that you believe that the book has taught. Tell me something you learned from the book. Yeah, Dave. Um, I was impressed with, with God's, God's justice and God's mercy. He's okay. just and he's punishing them for their sins, but then he's offering mercy um, if they'll if they'll turn. Okay, so you have both concepts, and, and that you find that over and over again in the prophets. God is just, God is merciful, God is willing to forgive. He's hoping people will repent so he can forgive them, but if they don't, there's going to be justice, justice and mercy both. Yes. Okay. What else? What's another lesson? You may have learned from the study. Anybody? That judgment is sure. Okay. Judgment is sure. Not only is there going to be justice and there's going to be mercy, but oh, again and again, we've seen this day of the Lord concept that uh, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of decision, uh, judgment is sure. God is going to bring uh, judgment on both good and bad, okay? What else have you learned from the book? Anything else? I think that prophecy of the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming on the apostles is an important part of it. Okay, and that's especially important for us in the New Testament because Peter expressly said that it was fulfilled beginning on the day of Pentecost, and it led into the rest of the book then showing us the promises that God has given to us today. So we have this the uh, promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit beginning on the day of Pentecost. Okay, what else did that uh, prophecy about the coming of the Holy Spirit, what else about it did we learn? There were some other couple of other things about it that we learned that were important. Not just the coming of the Holy Spirit, but what else? What did he that say in about Acts chapter two, that, that is the start of the last days. Okay. So we learned that was that the last days are not referring to the time just before Jesus' second coming, but it began on the day of Pentecost, and it's the time period in which Jesus is speaking to us through the New Testament, the gospel today. All right, that's another important lesson that we learned. And what about salvation? He, he, what, who did he say would be saved in that prophecy? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And what did we learn about calling on the name of the Lord? How do you do it? Recognize. Okay. Recognizing what he teaches in his word and be obedient. And in particular, uh, as Ananias told Saul, be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So we learn that that's done in the New Testament by obedience to the gospel, including baptism. Any other lessons anybody remembers or learned from the book that you'd like for us to summarize as we close? We need to teach our children um, these things too. Okay. All right. These are lessons that need to be taught to future generations uh, because they too can have the blessings of God's promises. Well, let me summarize the, the, the lessons that I uh, that, that I listed. Dave? Yes, go ahead. Just one observation. The book is so beautifully put together. As we took it apart verse by verse, I I really appreciate that, the time we took to see how the, the beginning talks about the ruin of the wine, the ruin of the grain, and, and comes together at the end with all the blessings. And this, just the way the, the book is put together, I'm just... I haven't noticed that the beauty of the book before. So, yes, I, I hope, I appreciate you 
making that comment, Bev. I hope that you have, uh, I've all come to an appreciation of the book. Uh, once you get the gist of where Joel is going, there's some very, to me, it's a very interesting book. Uh, some things I never had appreciated before. So the, the summary that I make of the things that I learned from the, the book of Joel, as some of you have mentioned, God punishes sin, but he rewards obedience. Uh, forgiveness requires uh, sincere sorrow and repentance. We talked about that at great length, that it has to be from the heart. A true sorrow, true repentance. We talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 in the last days, referring to the gospel age. The alien sinner calls upon the Lord by being baptized. And then there's the prophecies that we have seen that refer to the New Testament church uh, symbolically as Israel and Jerusalem and so on. So those are some things that I uh, specifically remembered from the book. Anything else anybody has before we close our study uh, here of the, the book of Joel? Okay. Well, let's continue uh, to com conclude our study this evening then of the book of Joel. I appreciate all of you who have participated in this study and uh, hope that people can join us now as we continue into our next study, which will be a study of the book of First Timothy. Thank you.